And while everyone trickles in, I'll take this opportunity to introduce everyone on your screen. So we have Don Phillip, our tech expert, Trish Crow Grande, the head of the history committee at OMA, uh, Dr. Chris Decker, our speaker, and I am Monica Segvari, the administrative assistant at OMA. And now normally Lindsay does the introductions for these events, but she is she couldn't make it today because she's running the Gangs, Guns and Grogs walking tour. Uh, if you have a chance, I highly recommend the tour. I did it a few weeks ago and it was a lot of fun. Uh, so they run every Wednesday until the end of September. Um, before we launch into the talk, I'd like to start off with some acknowledgements. First of all, thank you to Phil Jackman for creating the wonderful poster for the event. Um, we have Marianne Grant, who is the driving force behind the scenes and the reason the history speaker has been so successful. And thank you, our audience, for attending tonight. And to those of you who have donated, we are hugely appreciative. Finally, thank you to our phenomenal speaker for joining us tonight. Marianne wrote a beautiful introduction for Dr. Chris Decker, so these are her words. Dr. Chris De Decker is a retired physician and surgeon, a history lover and engaging speaker. He has delivered several talks at OMA in the past, including the life of Dr. John McRae, the man who penned the iconic in Flanders Fields, the history of Soldiers Memorial, Aurelia Soldiers Memorial Hospital, and he has been associated with the hospital for over 30 years, and a talk on Glenn Gould, one of the greatest pianists of the 20th century who had a cottage in our area. We thank him for sharing his research on Dr. Norman Bethune and for bringing this remarkable life into this remarkable man. His commitment to the OMA History Speaker Series and to keeping alive our local history over the years is very much appreciated. And now, without further ado, we present to you Dr. Chris Decker and his talk, Bethune, Communist, Innovator, Humanitarian, Muskokan. We, we do need one bit of ado before we start. Um, please, uh, we have a question and answer function here. If you have any questions of the speaker, please put them in the question and answer function. Uh, other comments should go in the chat. Your microphone will be muted, so you won't be able to ask the question directly. Okay, sorry, now you can. Thanks, Tom. And I am going to disappear now. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, um, Trish, the, um, and I'd like to um, uh, thank the uh, committee again for inviting me to uh, speak about uh, Dr. Henry Norman Bethune. He is a fascinating subject. Dr. Bethune um, was arguably the most famous, most interesting, and certainly the most controversial of uh, Canadian doctors uh, in the 1930s. There are many descriptors for uh, Dr. Uh, Norman Bethune, and many have a negative connotation. However, um, he is viewed with reverence by 1.4 billion people in China uh, because of the work that he did here. In Canada, not as much, but uh, it remains to be it remains to say that he still um, does have a. a, a uh, a good reputation here in Canada. So Dr. Bethune um, was born March 3rd, 1890, and he lived until November 12th, 1939. So um, on March 1st, 1546, Cardinal David Beaton in Scotland watched from a tower window of St. Andrew's Castle as one George Wishart was burned at the stake for criticizing the Roman Catholic Church. By burning that man, Cardinal Beaton was trying to stamp out new ideas and changes that were sweeping the country and his church at the time. In May of that year, a band of Protestants broke into his castle, killed Beaton, and threw him from the very window that he'd been watching that burning from. David Beaton was an ancestor, ancestor of Norman Bethune, and he died trying to prevent change, which we all know is impossible. All the descriptors of Norman Bethune, 
uh, I came across, I think change maker uh, is the most apt. The desire was to change medical care for the better by making it universal uh, for all Canadians um, uh, uh, as much as possible. So he was born um, in this house, and again, March 3rd, 1890, it's a 10 room house. Um, he was born to Ma uh, Malcolm and Elizabeth Beth Hume. Now, the house was a manse. Um, Malcolm Beth Hume, the father, was a Presbyterian church uh, minister. And as such, uh, Norman's upbringing was very religious, very strict. And his father um, also was a very forthright uh, man who spoke his mind and it was somewhat um, undiplomatic. And it's by no small measure that probably Norman inherited some of those characteristics. And this often got him into trouble with his parishioners. So as a result, uh, although Norman Bethune was born in Gravenhurst, the family moved um, in Ontario from there um, when Norman was about two or three years old. In fact, the family moved seven times. And by the time Norman um, entered high school, uh, they were in Owen Sound. So he had few uh, childhood friends. He had his own independence and his own temper, which made um, other kids uh, shy away. Um, he did rebel against his, uh, his father's strictness and clashed often with them. So this is Norman here, uh, and that's his sister, that's his younger brother, and that is his mother. Um, after finishing high school um, uh, in Owen Sound, um, he went to the north. He decided to go up to the area north of uh, Lake Superior and work in a lumber camp. And that's him with a bunch of other gentlemen uh, at the lumber camp. And um, he was there for about a year um, uh, chopping down trees. And then he moved briefly to um, an area called Edgeley, which was a small town or village in 1908, um, which uh, actually now is part of the Vaughan area, just in northwest of Toronto. Uh, northwest of Toronto. He taught school there for six months. But um, he decided to um, become a doctor. And so he enrolled first at uh, the University of Toronto in general studies in 1909. This is a picture of, of course, University College and um, at the University of Toronto. But he found it quite boring and his money um, was, uh, was running out. And so he quit in 1911. Um, so he went decided to go back to uh, lumbering and he went and worked uh, with in Frontier College uh, in 1911 doing some logging. But in addition to that, um, he also was working, um, uh, you know, 10 hour days doing that. And then in the evening, he would teach immigrants uh, to speak English in the evening. Um, he he um, In the fall of 1912, he returned to the University of Toronto but this time in medicine. Now, unfortunately, um, in 1914, the First World, War, First World War broke out and um, he enlisted right away. He was sent to France as a stretcher bearer where he saw the worst of the worst. I don't think it's any secret to uh, those of you that are here that the First World War was its own Holocaust. Um, it was a terrible conflict that really proved nothing in the end with horrendous slaughter and waste on the battlefields. Um, and indeed, um, at the second battle of Ypres, Ypres, and he was wounded in the leg and it was bad enough to send him back to Britain uh, for recovery. And he spent three months recovering there. And then um, in 1950, he came back to, um, to Canada and went back to medical school. He graduated from medical school um, in uh, 1917. And of interest is the fact that um, 
not, he wasn't the only well-known um, uh, student to graduate in the class of 17. Uh, Frederick Banting was in the same class. So no doubt they would have known each other because in those days they probably put students in alphabetical order for um, you know, uh, various seminars or labs or what have you. So they probably knew each other quite well, Banting and Hume. Um, so the war ended in 1918 and uh, he decided to uh, return to London to do his internship. And um, he enjoyed his time there and was at the hospital for sick children in London. Um, this is a, a more modern picture and the old building is still there, but there are more modern ones around it. Um, he then, um, uh, he enjoyed himself when he was there and he met a, um, an English woman who was quite a bit older than he was. She was very well to do and she seemed to take a shine to him and bankroll him for his budding interests in art and travel. But he traveled with a, a racy crowd who partied. He went on ja jaunts to Europe and he blew a lot of money um, while he was living there in England. He began painting and even sold some paintings as well. Um, but his mother was uh, quite religious as well um, as his father. And she was very worried about him and worried about his uh, rather sinful life. But this didn't have much of an effect on, on Norman. Um, uh, when his internship was over, he returned to Canada in 1919 and worked in locums as a general practitioner. He was rather flamboyant. Um, he dressed in rather unorthodox flamboyant ways. He wore garish clothes and women were attracted to him. He was described by others at that time as a peacock in the presence of penguins, which is, uh, I think, pretty funny. Um, he was a doctor though, and um, even then, despite his racy life, he was known for taking all classes of patients and all types of society, rich and poor alike. And that was um, in contradistinction to uh, many doctors uh, in that era who uh, would only take you if you could pay money, and that was in Canada. Um, finally, he made up his mind to become a surgeon. So in 1920, he returned to England for surgical training. Um, he spent a year in London and then another year in Edinburgh, Scotland, at uh, the Royal Infirmary. And this is a, uh, a drawing of the Royal Infirmary in, in, um, in London. It was now <clears throat> 1922. And he qualified as a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons. Now, may, you may ask, well, can you become a qualified surgeon um, after two years of training? And the, the answer is no. Um, a fellowship in the UK, though, is not quite like it is in Canada. In Canada, uh, we spend five years to get a, a fellowship, whereas in the UK, it's only two. However, they grant the fellowship uh, while you're in your training. So following attaining the fellowship, um, he had to do a few more years uh, before he was allowed to go and practice. We set, spent more time training in London, but in, when he was in Scotland previously, um, he met an attractive young Scottish woman by the name of um, Frances Penny Campbell. Now, She's not a young woman in this picture, but this is a picture of uh, Frances Penny Campbell. Um, she uh, liked him a lot. He was cheeky, he was um, unconventional, and he was conspicuous. And um, uh, Penny herself had, had um, lived a rather sheltered life, and so she was swept off his feet. And so they decided to get married. Um, her parents were appalled. Uh, by her choice. He was 10 years older. Um, he was in, uh, flamboyant. He was domineering. He was argumentative. They always seemed to be short of money. But nevertheless, uh, they got married on August 13, 1923. Uh, she also had just inherited a large sum of money from her uncle, which they spent almost entirely on a fabulous honeymoon uh, in Europe, which lasted about two or three months. 
Finally, um, at the age of 35, he decided to practice. So he now was a qualified surgeon. It was 1925, and they chose to go to Detroit, Michigan. He was hoping to be, uh, hoping it would be financially rewarding, and he worked there um, as a surgeon. But, uh, but working in the United States um, and trying to make money just was not his style. Uh, and so um, people would come along to see him and he would treat everybody. He, he would see and treat the poor. Um, sometimes farmers would come in and they'd pay him with pot roasts and vegetables or, or he wouldn't charge them at all. And occasionally when he had money and they were poor, he would give them, uh, give them money. So um, Francis wasn't used to that kind of instability in her life. He come from a well-to-do Scottish family. And so she was lonely uh, and unhappy in Detroit. It was a very different city than, than Edinburgh, for sure. And Norman wasn't so happy either with his uh, uh, American doctor counterparts. And so he also was disillusioned. He was angry and uh, turned to drinking. So she left him in um, 1926 and returned to Edinburgh. Uh, it's a lovely city if you haven't been. Um, it's worth seeing. Um, and um, uh, when he, but he was still in Detroit. And um, when he was uh, there, he began to get sick. Um, he lost weight. He became very fatigued um, and he was very weak. And in 1926, he was diagnosed with pulmonary tuberculosis or what we would call TB. <clears throat> and uh, he applied for and uh, got into a, a sanatorium. In those days, there was no antibiotics to treat TB. And so the treatment was to get good nutrition, rest and fresh air, hoping that the uh, TB would go away. This is the Trudeau, uh, Trudeau um, uh, Sanatorium in Saranac, New York, which is in the Adirondacks. I don't think it's related to the um, uh, current fellow running for our election here, uh, but I'm not 100% sure. Anyway, um, when you're in a sanatorium for TV, you're confined to bed for a month or two. And then finally you're allowed up to walk around and go outside and walk the grounds. Well, of course, Norman would break the rules. Um, he wouldn't just walk the grounds. He actually went into town. And occasionally what he would do is he would uh, make sort of a dummy in his bed, uh, look like he was asleep. And then he'd take off without anybody seeing him and he'd go into town then. He um, also continued to smoke, so he got worse from his, uh, his TV. He became somewhat suicidal at uh, Saranac. And then he began to read more about the, uh, the disease. And he um, read about the fact that there was a new experimental treatment called artificial pneumothorax. And um, what that is, is a treatment where, and it's a, a, a diagram here to explain it. Um, so pneumothorax, that means air in the chest. Pneumo has after like pneumatic tires, for example, and then thorax. So pneumothorax is uh, for TB, tuberculosis. I picture the lungs here as they're kind of like balloons and they expand and then they contract, allow oxygen in, and that oxygen mixes with your blood and it oxygenates your blood. But with pneumothorax, they put a needle between the ribs into the uh, chest, not into the lung itself, but between the chest wall and the lung. They pump in air and it collapses the lung. And it collapses it right down to this, to a small uh, thing, remnant. And that somehow allows the lung to um, relax uh, or, or be you know, not, uh, not active. And um, it does work or has worked for a tuberculosis. One of the problems, of course, is that it has to be done every few days, three to four days, um, to keep the pneumothorax um, you know, up at the same level. 
So, um, so he wanted that treatment. The doctors at uh, Saranac or the Trudeau Institute were reluctant to give it to him. It was a somewhat radical, um, not well studied treatment, but he insisted. And so they did it. And um, so on October 27th, uh, 1932, three days after the divorce from his wife, he got his pneumothorax. And um, to their surprise, it worked well. He recovered. He was discharged in December of 1932. Um, his time there, though, um, and his TB it had changed his path in life. Um, he decided to join the fight against TB. And uh, <clears throat> uh, he knew as well that for the most part, TB was a poor man's disease. Poor unsanitary uh, condition, living conditions, crowded conditions uh, often brought it on. And um, often lack of good health care was at the bottom of it. Um, so there is a famous quote by uh, Bethune about TV, which is likely still relevant today. There are two kinds of TB, the rich man's TB and the poor man's TB. Rich man will recover, whereas the poor man dies. So not only did he want to fight uh, the, the fight against tuberculosis, uh, but he also wanted to fight for access to health care for all individuals, regardless if they were rich or poor. Now, if he's going to be, if he was going to be working on tuberculosis, he needed to, need to get training or more training in thoracic surgery. And so he decided to go to Montreal. He, uh, he got in contact with uh, this man called Dr. Edward William Archibald, who was a pioneer of thoracic surgery a very big name in, in Montreal in the 1930s. And he asked him to, uh, if he could come and work with him. Dr. Um, Archibald said yes, but ironically, he said, but I want you to go back to New York State and go to another hospital in Saranac, the Hospital for Incipient Tuberculosis in Saranac. So he, um, uh, spent three months back in, at Saranac at the hospital, and then he went to work uh, with Dr. Archibald in 1928. But, you know, he is a guy who had an attitude, um, and um, he wasn't popular there. Um, he complained a lot. So, for example, uh, if a nurse um, handed him the wrong instrument, he'd get angry and he'd uh, throw it on the floor. Um, he complained if the nurse, if the instruments didn't work uh, the way they should. But um, to his credit, um, if something didn't work well, he looked at it why, and he would go home and he'd try to redesign it, and then uh, get the hospital machinist to redesign the instrument. And so, in fact, there are several patents in um, Bethune's name. Now, for example. Uh, the rib cutter, if you think about it, if you're going to operate on the lung, you've got to cut out a chunk of the ribs to get access to the lungs. And that <clears throat> rib cutter uh, still has his name and it's still uh, used today. Uh, but life was going better for him. Um, he knew what he wanted to do. Um, he sort of found himself. And um, so he, uh, and he had an income and he was happier. So he got in touch with his uh, ex-wife, um, Frances, and he always loved her and pleaded for her to come back. She was reluctant, but she agreed to uh, remarry him. And so they did that in 1929. And this is a, a picture of them um, uh, in 1929. But truthfully, things were just not to, things just did not work out with him and, uh, and, and Frances. And so they divorced for a final time in uh, 1932. Um, continued to do uh, continued to do research. Um, some of that was very unconventional as well. Um, here, here is with a group of colleagues, of course. And um, for example, if somebody got a infection on the chest wall, and uh, there was a lot of pus and uh, infection on the chest, or anywhere for that matter, he'd heard about maggots. 
uh, little worms that um, uh, could be applied to a wound and the wound, the maggots would eat all the dead tissue. And so he, um, he did a trial of this and in fact published a paper on the use of magnet, maggots. Now you may squirm, but in fact maggots, um, even now, even recently, um, have been used on really, uh, you know, devastatingly infected wounds. Uh, but it was very unorthodox to be doing something like that in the 1930s. And of course, the arrow, that's, that's uh, uh, even there. Um, he was energetic, he was egotistical, he was creative, and he was very popular with medical students because he, um, he was a good speaker and he could, he, um, he would talk to them and um, they were shocked though by his sort of informal ways and his argumentative ways. He was also a bit of a show off in the operating room. He liked to operate very quickly uh, and would uh, sometimes take chances both in the patients he'd operate on, but also uh, just the speed with which he operated. And so Dr. Archibald was not that happy with them. Um, uh, some of his patients didn't do that well. And so he, um, he decided that um, he wanted to uh, get rid of them. They weren't getting along. And that was after four years, uh, Dr. Um, Archibald asked him to leave. So as many of you probably know, the best way to get rid of somebody is to recommend them for a job somewhere else. And that's what Archibald did. Um, he recommended them to the, the Sacred Heart Hospital or Sacre Coeur Hospital in Montreal. They knew of his reputation <clears throat> uh, and they were reluctant, but they needed a chest surgeon. And so they, uh, they, they, they took him and he did a pretty good job there. Um, again, he remained unconventional. Um, he spoke at conferences, he was research, he did research, he was quite academic, and um, he was on his own, he was uh, lonely, and um, um, I guess financially, he did not do very well. Remember that this was in the middle of the Depression, this is the night, mid-1930s, mid, mid and he was struck by the divide in um, medical care in Canada at that time. Here is the, the medical system that was not working well. Um, people that needed it the most, the poor, um, had no way of affording health care. And if you were a worker that complained about, um, uh, you know, those kinds of things, you were branded as a communist. Um, he'd see people in red lines affected by the depression. And in fact, he volunteered um, work at the Montreal Unemployment uh, Association to treat anybody that was sick or out of work. And he fought against evictions as well during the uh, depression. He became known as a fairly radical uh, outspoken doctor. In um, 1935, he decided to go to Russia and uh, there was a conference there on physiology and so he went to what was then called Leningrad. It's, it's it reverted back to St. Petersburg. And this is a, this is not the hospital, but that is a, um, a, a church or chapel, an Orthodox Russian church in St. Petersburg. And um, he was very impressed with the egalitarian uh, system that they had in, in, um, in Russia. It was a classless society. And he felt that the poor in Canada would probably welcome uh, that kind of a society. He was there three months and then he returned. And what he did, he was um, uh, in quite a lot of demand um, as, a, as a speaker. Um, uh, and he gained attention um, by the, from the um, uh, Canadian Communist Party and he began to attend their meetings um, in 1935 after returning from Russia. And um, he wanted to change the healthcare system and got involved politically. He, um, he started to uh, read reports on medical, um, how med uh, medicine is organized at the political level. 
He gathered statistics. He wrote letters. He formed his own group called the Montreal Group for Security of People's Health. And he, um, there was an election in 1935 in Quebec. And he wanted to um, have some influence on that and hope that politicians might take the cause under their wing. But um, what he got was apathy. And he became angry and depressed and uh, was um, uh, shunned in terms of the election. Um, so he, um, uh, but he made the newspapers. Um, there were pictures of him. Uh, you can see him saluting here with his fist and he was uh, branded as a communist. But, um, he said he was only um, uh, uh, doing that to uh, uh, encourage uh, people to uh, fight for their rights. Um, then in 1936, the Spanish Civil War broke out. And uh, basically the politics behind that is it was a struggle between the fascists of uh, Generalissimo Francisco Franco. So, you know, Franco only died in the 1970s. So you may remember, uh, uh, you know, Franco was around when most of us were, you know, younger. Um, he died in the 1970s at a rather old age. And uh, they were fascists and they were um, pitted against the democratically elected Republicans. And here's a picture of Franco here uh, in the war years. There he is with Hitler um, saluting. And um, so that was the enemy as far as uh, um, uh, Bethune was concerned. Um, there was a, a, a committee in Canada um, called the Committee to Aid Spanish Democracy, based in Toronto. And they approached Bethune to head up a medical unit uh, to go to Madrid. So here's Spain. Uh, this is Madrid here, obviously, right in the center of the city, uh, of the country. Um, this is this purple area, that's the Republican control. And that is the, um, the, good, the good guys. And then this area here was under Franco. This was the nationalists and the fascists. And so they were all attacking uh, Madrid because Madrid was in the Republican area. And so the uh, fascists were trying to uh, get there. But, um, <clears throat> he thought he, he would like to go to Spain to uh, help out with the cause. And... Um, so he resigned his position in Montreal. He willed everything to his divorced wife and headed to Spain uh, on the 10th of October, 1936. Um, one might say he was, he was at the age of 46 and perhaps he was having a midlife crisis. I don't know, but anyway, that's what he did. So he arrived in Madrid in November of 1936. And his aim was to start a mobile blood transfusion unit. Um, he'd been in the war before and he'd seen lots of blood loss from the First World War and realized that blood had to get into patients in a hurry rather than waiting maybe hours and days to get to a hospital. And so he decided that he would uh, develop a mobile blood transfusion unit. And it was very different. And he didn't want to just be a doctor in, in Madrid. And so um, he formed a group. He explained his um, desires to do this with the, see if I can pronounce this, the Socorro Rojo International, which basically is the Spanish Red Cross. And was the only um, organization that was giving medical services to the Republican side. They were skeptical of him, um, that he could save lives, but they gave in. And in fact, he was able to get $10,000 in supplies um, uh, from the CASD, that was the Canadian Association of Spanish Democracy. And they bought supplies, but they also bought this ambulance. And they bought, they bought blue uniforms. So in color, he's in a dark blue uniform, and that's, that's uh, Beth Moon there. Well, the unit was called the Canadian Blood Transfusion uh, Unit, and it was headquartered in uh, Madrid. And in fact, the um, um, blood, the uh, the um, nationalists were very close to uh, 
uh, Madrid. In fact, they were only 25 kilometers from where his apartment was. Um, he worried that there would not be donors, but in fact, it was huge. People gave lots of blood and um, they were able to uh, provide blood transfusions to, uh, to uh, soldiers fighting against uh, Franco. Um, <clears throat> he was very disappointed in Can Canada's response uh, at this time because Mackenzie King, who was uh, Prime Minister of Canada at the time, um, he made it a law it was illegal to fight, uh, to send Canadians over to fight in that civil war. Yet hundreds of Canadians did sign up for the International Brigade. Um, it was a big success, this blood uh, transfusion um, uh, system, and but it, they were losing the war and they had to reorganize. So the, the nationalists had to reorganize. And um, I mean, the Republicans. And so um, uh, part of the reorganization though was that they wanted everything under their command. And so they basically told Bethune that um, they're gonna take over his truck blood transfusion uh, service. And of course, uh, he uh, it was difficult to deal with in Spain as he had been elsewhere. He was drinking too much um, and uh, was getting angry. And so um, eventually what happened is the CASD, the Canadian Association for Spanish Democracy, recalled him from, um, from us, uh, Canada to go back to, to um, we called him from Canada to go back to Canada to ostensibly do more fundraising. So he arrives back in Canada in 1937 and he's a hero. Like, um, he gets to Union Station in Toronto, the, the train station, comes out onto the street and there's huge crowds greeting him. And in fact, they have this, this um, parade, you know, uh, on Front Street, um, uh, you know, welcoming him, welcoming him back to Canada. And he was a real celebrity, uh, for sure. He gave a speech and then he began touring around Canada and also the US advocating for socialized medicine and free healthcare uh, for all, which probably didn't go down too well in the United States. Um, and donations poured in though, uh, especially from Canada. In 1937, he admitted to being a communist and you have to realize that in those days, um, communism <clears throat> was a really dirty word because Stalin Word had got out from Stalin that he was you know, murdering all kinds of people, millions of people in Russia. And so it was, was uh, rather dimly viewed. That didn't stop the, the crowds from coming. And uh, he did accumulate a lot of money for the Canadian Blood Transfusion Service uh, by coming back to Canada. But he realized that he couldn't do that forever and that he wasn't gonna go back into just regular practice. And so we also know that at that time, there was troubles in China. He was in great turmoil. And um, in the 1920s and 30s in particular, they were going through a, a very difficult period of war. Well, this is The Last Emperor. So you might recall the movie, The Last Emperor. Well, this is the guy, this is the real uh, Last Emperor. His name was Pu Yi. And um, he advocated in 1912, after 2000 years of imperial rule, it wasn't just him that ruled for 2000 years, but it was uh, obviously previous uh, emperors. And what uh, formed after that <clears throat> was a constitutional republic. That soon fell apart. And there really was a lot of chaos in uh, China in the 1920s um, um, until finally in, in the late 1920s, um, uh, a num the, uh, the factions all got together and they were divided basically into the communists under Mao Zedong. This is a young Mao Zedong, um, uh, spelt really in China, Mao Zedong. And also uh, under the right-wing nationalists uh, of Chiang Kai-shek. And so these are the right-wing uh, people. Now, the Tudors 
try to convince the people to come to their side. And they ended up fighting each other in the 1920s uh, in what's called the Second Chinese Civil War. There was a, a earlier one uh, in the uh, 1890s. But now um, at this point um, in 1931, Japan was becoming strong and they had territorial ambitions for Northern China. And so they wanted to uh, get some of the land in China for, you know, because they were overpopulated. And so they attacked and they conquered Manchuria. So in 1931, um, the Japanese, uh, you know, landed in, in China and took over Manchuria and that was called the Second Sino-Japanese War. So fortunately, uh, the, the communists and the nationalists decided that their main enemy then was the Japanese. And so they decided to uh, join forces together, get the Chinese out. So this map just shows you a little bit. This is 1941, but really it was the same in the 1930s. The, um, the green part is the nationalist. This would be Chiang Kai-shek's area of uh, dominance. The uh, pink is the communists under uh, Mao Zedong, small areas. And this blue part is the, the Japanese. So uh, these folks, the blue and the pink, were um, trying to keep, um, um, you know, get, get the rest of Manchuria back uh, out of the hands of the Chinese. So that was the... Um, uh, Sino-Japanese War. Um, so, uh, 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 Bethune um, landed in China. I'm not sure where exactly. This is where he wanted to go. He, um, <clears throat> this was where Mao Zedong was, and he wanted to um, uh, uh, join him and, and uh, treat the communists. And so he had, it took him two months to get from the coast of China into this little village of Ya'an, I think is how it's pronounced, I'm not sure. Um, he saw that this was a, another purpose for his life and he certainly wanted to give, um, uh, get the Chinese, give the Chinese communists a, a hand. And so um, it took two months to arrive, but finally, in uh, April of 1938, they did meet. So this is a, a painting actually of Mao meeting uh, Beth Yun. And uh, they met in Yan'an in Sichuan province, uh, which was a remote area. It was very, it's a very hilly area and very isolated. And one of the advantages of this area is there were lots of caves for protection. So he put his uh, medical unit or hospital in a cave they were, uh, they got along very well. And, um, but Beth Yun um, was appalled at the medical conditions in China, um, even worse than in Spain um, that he'd seen. There was no electricity. And so because of that, they couldn't refrigerate blood, could not be preserved. They couldn't give blood transfusions. There was filth everywhere. And uh, Beth Yun, again, blew his top at all this. But after a while, he realized it really wasn't the Chinese fault. It was, uh, you know, poverty and they were in the middle of a war and, uh, and so forth. And so uh, he did cool down. Um, fortunately for him, he bought a typewriter and he had pen and ink. He did a lot of typing when he wasn't working. Uh, he spent time at his typewriter and um, he, uh, he was requesting more help from North America. It wasn't forthcoming. Um, and um, uh, get, trying to get funds and that kind of thing. Um, they also had to keep on moving because um, the Japanese were on their tails um, and they eventually uh, made moves into further into Northern China. Everywhere that he went, uh, they would be greeting, the, the, the crowds heard about him, the, the, the Chinese people had heard about him and when their group came into a, a village, the crowds would be cheering as, as they heard uh, good things about this great Canadian doctor. Um, so they, they got to a little place called um, San Yan Kao, which is near the Great Wall of China. 
and they built themselves a little hospital in part of a Buddhist temple. Um, the Chinese noticed, of course, that he had just incredible energy. He was driven. He was uh, very energetic. And he organized uh, construction of this hospital. By the way, Song Kao is very much the same uh, today as it was then. And this is actually a modern picture of it. Um, he trained staff there. He prepared for the sick and the wounded. And um, I'm just going to read for it to you at one um, something um, that he wrote when, when he was there uh, on his typewriter. Um, is it possible that a few rich men, a class, small class of men, have persuaded a million poor men to attack and attempt to destroy another million men as poor as they, so that the rich may be richer still? Terrible thought. How did they persuade these poor men to come to China? By telling them the truth? No, they would never have come if they had known the truth. Did they dare tell these workmen that the rich only wanted cheaper raw materials, more markets and more profits? No, they told them that this brutal war was the destiny of the race for the glory of the emperor. It was for the honor of the state, it was for their king and country. This would have been pertaining to the Japanese armies that had, um, had come and the, uh, the soldiers that um, had come from Japan and, and died. Uh, the, Ch the Chinese though, just marveled at them. And finally in September of 1938, um, the hospital opened. It was destroyed close, uh, not too long after that uh, by the Japanese. Um, his, um, Next idea was to uh, train mobile medical units to go to the front lines. And then they moved to what's called Hebei province, which is even further north in uh, Mongolia. And this is of course the area of Manchuria that they, um, the Japanese had gone into. And they set up an operating room in a temple that had no walls. The roof was sheets draped over beams and they had a log fire keeping them warm. And he would operate sometimes 40 hours straight on a few occasions. He started giving blood transfusions from donor to patient lying on the bed. So that's, what, uh, that's a picture of him uh, working away. And this is what donor to uh, patient was. So in other words, in the 19th century, uh, well, probably in the early 20th century, blood would be pumped directly from a patient into another rather than you know, plastic bags like we have now, go so from one patient to other. So they were doing that in, in, uh, in, in China. Um, the patients were skeptical there about donating their blood, but they did. And um, they realized, of course, that uh, Bethune was not just like any other Westerners that they had seen. For example, a mother was very grateful that he had repaired uh, her daughter's hair lip which had prevented her from speaking. It had nothing to do with the war, but uh, he did it anyway. Um, and here's a picture of him uh, working. It's a famous picture of him working in uh, China. And he was the only doctor for hundreds of kilometers. Um, it was now 1939. And he had no contact with the outside world. He had no newspapers to read. Uh, he had no uh, radio to listen to. He didn't know that Franco had won in Spain. And he didn't even know that World War II was about to start. Um, the Japanese uh, found his hospital inside the temple and they destroyed it, but he, they rebuilt it. And it was completed in, in uh, September of 1939. His own health was failing and, um, you know, was it the TB that had uh, redeveloped he was malnourished himself because there was very little food. He worked ridiculous hours and was planning to return to Canada. But on, um, in October of 1939, he was doing a simple operation on a soldier and he was operating without gloves. And you can see here that he's not wearing gloves. Um, and that was uh, pretty common. And he cut his finger on a scal from a scalpel and he got infected. 
And so he didn't pay any attention to that. It had happened before, but it got worse, um, probably from his own malnutrition and uh, his own uh, poor health at that time. He developed septicemia, which means uh, infection spreading throughout his entire body. There were no antibiotics and um, he died on a hut in um, Hang Shi Ku in Hebei province, November 12th. 1939, and he was only 49 years old. Soldiers and civilians were very distraught at that. Um, they certainly displayed their tears. Mao Zedong um, heard of his death and was very moved. Um, in fact, he wrote his eulogy. And if you go to the, um, uh, the Beth Newman House in Gravenhurst, they have a little museum there. And this is uh, Mao Zedong's uh, eulogy it's written in Chinese. This is what was sound. This was what was written um, uh, in his eulogy. Um, his coffin was put in a hillside in a place called Zhu Cheng. In 1952, it was moved to the North China Martyr Cemetery in Shizhuang, China, um, uh, and it was associated with the park. There's a park that's dedicated to 25,000 Chinese communists who fought nationalists and the Japanese in the 1930s. Thousands of people visit this tomb every year in China. And now there's a large hospital in uh, Shizhuang. Uh, this is the Northern Bethune International Peace Hospital. Uh, that's a, a, a statue of him. That's the hospital in behind there. It looks pretty fancy. Uh, not quite like OSNH. Um, and um, that is in. So interestingly, uh, before I uh, end, um, uh, this is Yan'an today um, and much bigger than it was then. And this is Xi Zhuang now, which is a city of million, millions of people in uh, Northern China. Now, I don't know if there's time um, I'm not sure how long I've been at this, um, but uh, I would like to read, well, I think maybe I should stop. So I think I will at this point uh, conclude. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. I think you need to type them. Uh, so we do have one comment so far. Uh, it's from Ruth Bradley St. Sir. Uh, she says, FYI, there is another very great Canadian doctor who worked in China at the same time as Bethune. Until the Japanese overran his hospital, his name is Dr. Robert Bayer McClure, Baird McClure. He was born in China to a missionary doctor and his wife, then trained in Toronto and returned to China as a missionary doctor himself. He opened the hospital with barefoot doctors doing triage in the surrounding countryside. He was also very technical and could build an x-ray machine from scratch. Yes, uh, Dr. McClure is well known. I've, I've certainly seen him on television and, and, and uh, yes, you're quite right. Uh, that, that is true. Dr. McClure um, is a very well-known doctor um, in Canada and uh, I imagine in China as well. Right. Are there any more questions? Uh, are, we doing, are we doing for time? Uh, was, was that, how long was that? Was that an hour? Uh, yes, you ended pretty much on time. It's 7.53, so we have um, a few minutes a few for Q&A. Yes. Okay. Uh, um, any, other, uh, any other questions or comments? Yes, so Janet Houston asks, are there lasting effects of Dr. Bethune on accessible healthcare in, in China? Um... <laughs> I don't know if that's the, I know that the answer to that question. They do have a socialized form of healthcare for sure. Um, and so, I mean, it is basically a communist country. He, he himself was a communist. And so I'm, I would think that they would have, the whole system has been communist, you know, a socialized system um, ever since that he was there. I think one of the things too that, that you know, they marveled at was just his dedication and, uh, here was a Westerner that had come over and he was so different uh, than to compare to what um, 
they had expected from uh, Westerners they'd had uh, you know experiences with before. Uh, Ruth wants to know what was it that you were going to read? Okay, I'm happy to read it. It will take maybe one minute, I hope. Okay. Two minutes, maybe. Okay, it's called The Epilogue. And it's a, it's a very nice book that I, I picked up uh, actually at the museum on uh, Norman Bethune. Um, Canadians reacted quietly to the news of Norman's death. While his body was lying in state in Zhu Cheng, the Canadian government passed an amendment to the War Measures Act banning the Communist Party of Canada and making it unlawful for Canadians to belong. Norman's embrace of communism was embarrassing to say the least, and officially Canada tried to ignore him. In the years following his death, however, relations between Canada and China improved. Chinese visitors and officials wanted to see Norman's birthplace in Gravenhurst, Ontario. They wanted to go into the house where he had been born, the old Presbyterian manse. By 1973, Pierre Trudeau's Liberal government felt obliged to acknowledge what Norman had done. They bought the old house, restored it to look as it had when the Bethings lived there, and made it into a museum. It opened in 1976. China and Canada jointly issued stamps of Norman in 1990. The Royal Canadian Mint struck a 1997 $5 coin, showing him riding a horse in a caravan of soldiers and mules. In August 2000, Governor General Adrian Clarkson unveiled the bronze statue of Norman in downtown Gravenhurst. Almost half a century after his death, however, 1998 induction into the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame continued to stir up controversy. Some Canadians opposed his induction. The reasons were that he had supported a political party that intentionally starved millions of people and that he had deserted Canada and saved the lives of Chinese whose sons may well have fought later against Canadians. They also claimed that Norman would have been forgotten by the Chinese if the Chinese hadn't eventually succeeded in taking over China. They felt he would have faded into obscurity if Mao hadn't used Norman as a political tool to urge the people on to greater selflessness. Supporters argued that Norman possi couldn't possibly have seen into the future or known about, the, known about starvation. They pointed out that he helped people and saved lives. Regardless of his political opinion, he was a great humanitarian. If Norman had been around to defend himself, he would have leapt into the debate and argued passionately. He would also have been pleased to see that his countrymen could be stirred out of complacency after all. Whatever people think of Dr. Norman Bethune's ideology and motives, was an ingenious and dedicated doctor. He treated all lives equally and fought to bring the same level of Medicare to all Canadians, something we are still struggling with today. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we have another comment and another question. I think okay. we can fit them in. Uh, so the comment is, uh, from Annie, uh, when we were in Yunnan province in Southwest China in 1985, most older people who heard we were Canadian would just beam and say, and she's uh, spelt it out phonetically, uh, be tu ne. That, that's how they say it, said Bethune. Um, so that's the comment. And then the question uh, from David is, is Bethune a as popular in China now as he was following the war in the 1930s? I think so. In fact, uh, for sure now, because I'm not sure that during the, those times that there were the same communications as there are now, but I think the short answer to that question is yes. Okay. So I think that's everything and we are right on time. It's just almost eight o'clock. So I will hand it over to Trish to give her her final remarks. Okay. 
Thanks a lot, Monica. Um, on behalf of OMA and uh, the History Committee, I want to thank, first of all, uh, Dr. Decker for coming uh, tonight to share your insight on the life and times and the achievements of Dr. Norman Bethune. I know I found it very informative. Um, I really did understand his full breadth of contributions in the medical field and his extent of involvement in the Spanish Civil War. So thank you for uh, sharing your wealth of knowledge with us tonight. Much appreciated. Um, I also like to thank, and I also like to thank all of those who have attended tonight. As always, your support of the History Committee Speaker Series is much appreciated. And as in our previous talks, too, these will uh, this talk will be uploaded into YouTube. So if you wish to see it again or want to share it with your friends, so they can listen in, that would be awesome. Um, with regards to our speaker series, we do have some. Lots more coming your way. So on October 20th, um, Fred, uh, Fred Kalin, who's a member of our history committee, will present Alfred Nobel and the Canadian Nobel Prize winners. So there are currently 24 Canadian winners of the Nobel Prizes, and there's actually one from Simcoe County. So join us and find out who they are and why each of them won the Nobel Prize. Um, OMA's annual Carmichael Art History Lecture Fundraiser will be held on November 17th. The event is held annually to honor the group of seven artists, Franklin uh, Carmichael, who was born and raised in Aurelia. Our guest speaker is Dr. Anna Hudson. Uh, she's a professor at York University. She's an art historian, a curator, and she specializes in 19th and 20th century art in Canada. And her talk will be for the evening, The Legacy of the Group of Seven, The Toronto Community of Painters, Art and Social Progress. Then just to give you a tidbit for 2022, we're going to kick off the year in January with the launch of the OMA Book Club, where all the books in discussion will be held by local authors. And I think the plan is to meet, to meet monthly. Uh, to support this book club launch for our January speaker series, Dave Town has graciously agree to allow us to study his book for that kickoff, which is also going to be the subject of the speaker's event, Chief Yellowhead's Revolt. So there'll be more information coming up on that on the website in a future speaker series. So thanks again, Chris, and to all of you for your support and for joining us tonight, and we'll see you uh, next month. Thank you. Bye.